very much. Um, so this morning we've heard uh, uh, Dima speak about the Ising model, and the Ising model is one of the paradigmatic models in statistical mechanics. And uh, uh, there's beautiful work on the Ising model, not just in two dimensions, but in various other settings as well. Um, what I will be now, now be talking about is another paradigmatic model in statistical physics, and that's called percolation. And who of you have heard about percolation, seen a course of it, or... Okay, who has not? Okay, that's pretty good. I will still give the introduction, so don't worry. Uh, but at least I know that there's something that I can uh, uh, rely on. Now, percolation is best known when you do it on an infinite lattice. So what is the idea? You have a lattice, you have edges. I'll just stick to uh, uh, bond percolation. So you have lots of edges and you remove them independently with a fixed probability. That's the simplest setting. And then you can imagine when that when you uh, erase almost all the edges, then basically nothing remains. So in, in particular, you're not going to have an infinite component after erasing all the edges at random. But when you keep lots of edges, then actually you will have an infinite uh, component remaining, and often this infinite component is unique. Now you can sort of feel that this, this process is monotone, right? If you keep on uh, 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 removing more and more, your clusters are going to become smaller and smaller, or if you're adding more and more edges, your clusters are going to become bigger and bigger, and therefore there has to be some critical value at which you see something peculiar happening, namely above it you will see an infinite component, and below it you will, uh, you will not. So that's percolation on an infinite graph. So what you should think about is ZD, Z2, Z3, Z4, or whatever. And what you have is that uh, there exists a unique PC, which of course depends on the graph. And below it you're not going to have an infinite component, above it you're going to have an infinite component, and close to it is where all the fun happens. So that's basically what Dima was saying today, but then for the Ising model, where you also have a critical value, and sort of everything that is interesting in the Ising model is happening very close by this critical point. Okay? So, uh, above infinite component, below none. I will be talking about a slightly different setting, and this is the setting in which our graph is not infinite, but it's finite. And then this, this beautiful picture of this uniquely identifiable phase transition collapses completely. So it's not at all clear how you should define what the critical value is. Because you know, the cluster is going to be finite at every point of P, even when P is 1, because you start with a finite graph. So what, I'm, what my main message will be today is that in many settings you can actually identify what critical behavior means, but you have to be a bit more careful. And also, this critical value is not uniquely defined. There's a large range of values for which the behavior is roughly the same. Okay? That's the main message. And we'll discuss this on high-dimensional tori. The main example, of course, is the hypercube, which is an example of a finite graph, and of which it's not entirely clear how many of its edges you should remove in order to get something that is sort of Somewhat connected, but not completely connected. So this is work with uh, 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 Asaf Nachmias, which was published in January this year. It was completed in 2012. Let that also be a lesson for PhD students. It can take a long time before your paper finally appears. <laughs> and it's building on joint work with lots of people, including uh, a, a PhD, former PhD student of mine, Markus Heidenreich, and there's also some other PhD student coming up later, la uh, later on. My postdoc boss, Gordon Slade, uh, Christian Borgs and Jennifer Chase, who, whom I've met when I was a postdoc at Microsoft Research, and Joel Spencer. All right, so what, what are we talking about? Well, first of all, we're talking about the hypercube. And the hypercube is very easy to imagine in three dimensions, where it's just the corners of the cube, and you connect the corners to one another. But if you're thinking about a hypercube in 76 dimensions, then it's a bit more difficult to imagine. And actually, our dimension is going to go to infinity because we want to have large graphs, right? So how, how do you define this? 
Well, the vertices are just collections of zeros and ones. Think of these as the corners of a high dimensional cube. And you connect two corners with one another when they're actually differing by precisely one coordinate. And if you think about what a cube is in three dimensions, this is precisely what it is. Okay? But this definition holds in any dimension. Now, this is a finite graph. Uh, the volume is 2 to the power n. That's the number of elements in it. And the degree of every vertex is n. That's the number of neighbors that every vertex has. Okay? So n, on the one hand, is the dimension, but n also describes the size of the graph as well as the degree of every vertex in the graph. And it's a very nice graph because it's completely transitive. Every vertex looks the same, etc., etc. So percolation is described here. We look at bonds and we make them independently there or not there, occupied or vacant. And it's occupied with some probability p that we will later have to choose appropriately, and vacant with a probability 1 minus p, independently of everything else. So I think of the vacant edges as being completely removed from my graph. That means that I have a random subgraph and I'm only allowed to walk along the edges that are remaining. Okay? Now this model was first studied by Erich and Spencer, two very big names in random graph theory. Um, in 1979, and what they looked at was the connectivity transition. So how large should P be in order for this, for percolation on this graph, to be completely connected? So that even along the edges that are kept, you can still walk from any vertex to any other vertex. And what you see is that P actually has to be pretty big. It's basically one half. Right? So let me make a, few, uh, a little table here about what we know about the critical value, because that's what this talk is all going to be about, I mean, how to quantify critical values. And here we're thinking about the hypercube, which I'll denote by T2n, the two-dimensional, or, or sorry, the, the hyper, the tora, torus with side length 2 in dimension n. The reason for introducing this is that later we will generalize this. And then we know that the critical value for connectivity is roughly a half. And that's Erdos Spencer, 79. Okay, now what we would like to study, and that's actually what Erdos and Spencer proposed in their paper, is the connectivity, uh, not the connectivity threshold, but the occurrence of a large cluster in this graph when P varies. And we will see that P has to be much smaller for that. Michael? Yeah. Is there any handwaving argument why it must be one half? Yes, there is. Um, So what you should look at is the number of isolated points. So there are two to the power n points, and the probability for a point to be isolated is one half to the power n. So the expected number of isolated points at this point is precisely one. And th this is a slight generalization, and then you see that this mean is roughly correct. It's a Poisson approximation. Good question. All right. Now, One of the things we see is that the, uh, uh, the hypercube, it's a, it's a high dimensional graph where vertices have high degree, right? But it has a lot of geometry that actually makes it difficult. So rather than studying the hypercube, you could also study the complete graph, which is sort of somewhat similar. It has size little n uh, and all the edges are there. So there's no geometry whatsoever. Every two vertices are a neighbor. And now I can do precisely the same thing, namely keep each edge with probability p independently of, of all the other ones, and then see what, what happens to the connectivity structure of this graph. Now this is a very old problem, this is called the erdos renyi random graph, sometimes called the binomial erdos renyi random graph, it was actually invented by Gilbert around the same time that Erdos and Renyi started working on the, on the problem. And uh, what Erdos and Renyi did was Uh, dis display uh, a double jump phenomenon. And the double jump is that if you take p to be of this form, where bear in mind this epsilon could also be negative, think of epsilon as being relatively small, but in the first case fixed. If epsilon is negative, then the largest connected component is basically logarithmic in the size, quite small, dust. Whereas if epsilon is positive, then actually it contains a positive proportion of the number of vertices. So it's huge. It's like the giant component in, in infinite graphs, right? The giant component also contains a positive proportion of the vertices. And here, that's the, the same thing is true. So it basically says that the, the critical value should be somewhere around 1 over n. 
Now, what you also know is that at the point 1 of Ren, there's something special happening. And there, the cluster sizes are of the order n to the power 2 thirds. So you have anomalous behavior, intricate scaling relations, critical exponents. Okay? This is interesting. So, basically, what we see is that for the complete graph, we get that PC is roughly 1 over n. But there's a little bit more because you can study for which values of P you basically have the same scaling as for P precisely 1 over n. Okay, you can imagine that if you, you change P just a little bit, then you're going to add very few edges, so actually you're not going to change the critical components too much. If you change it by too much, then all of a sudden the whole thing is going to uh, uh, clump together and you're going to have something which is, which is a lot bigger. Now, the, the precise amount that is allowed is something of the order a constant over n to the power one-third that you can multiply your probability with. That's the same thing as saying that you can add a little bit, which is lambda divided by n to the power four-thirds. I have a reason for writing it this way. Okay? So this is sometimes called the critical window. Now what we see in this critical window, and there's lots of beautiful results, here I'm just uh, uh, scratching the surface, um, what we know is that the largest connected component there is of the order n to the power two thirds, but actually you have many components that are that large. In fact, if you multiply by n to the power minus two thirds, so you renormalize, then actually this vector will converge in, in any topology that you, you would like, and the, the limits will be proper random variables. So you have really beautiful, intricate, critical behavior with funny uh, critical exponents. Um, here I would like to mention two, the n to the power two thirds, so you have a two third there and you have a one third there. Okay, so that's precisely the kind of results that I'm after. But then in more general settings. Now, actually, you can show that, these, these, that this scaling window really is a unique scaling window. If you take your P to be slightly different, then actually you're, you're sort of subcritical or supercritical. In the sense that only in this regime your critical, your critical components are random, even after taking the scaling limit. And um, the, the first and the second are of similar order of magnitude. So if you approach this, uh, this critical value 1 over n more slowly than like n to the power, n to the power minus 1 third, then you'll actually either be supercritical when the thing is, is positive or subcritical when the thing is negative. Okay, and that can be quantified in the following sense that if epsilon is much larger than n to the power minus 1 third and p is 1 plus epsilon over n, then the, critical exp the, the largest connected component is basically 2 times epsilon times n, which is substantial. And uh, that actually is concentrated. And the second largest component is much smaller. So there you have a unique largest component. Whereas in the subcritical regime, same setting, but now epsilon much smaller than minus n to the power of minus one third. So you're away from the critical window, but on the left hand side, then actually your, your largest connected component is roughly of the order one over epsilon squared times the log of epsilon cubed times n. And it turns out that the second largest is equally big and the third largest is also equally big, and the fourth largest is also equally big. So you basically have a conglomeration of many clusters that basically have the same order of magnitude in the subcritical sub regime, and they're really much smaller than what happens here in the supercritical regime. So somehow what you should think about is that you have the scaling window where you see critical behavior. This is a, a rough proxy for subcritical and supercritical behavior, but actually it connects up nicely and continuously. As soon as you're outside of the scaling window, you're either subcritical or supercritical. That's the picture. Now we would like to establish such a picture in more general settings, in particular for uh, the hypercube. All right. Now, of course, this, this question of Erdős and Spencer was picked up um, sometime later. The first paper on it is 1982. And in the paper of 1982 by Aitai Aitai, Komros and Samoreddy, they basically did something very similar to what Erdős and, uh, and Renyi did for the, 
for the complete graph. Namely, you take p to be a constant over the degree. So 1 plus epsilon divided by n, where little n you should really think of as being the degree. And then you see different behavior for the settings where epsilon is strictly positive, but fixed, and epsilon strictly negative and fixed. But here the change is rather dramatic, because if epsilon is positive, then the size of the giant component is basically 2 to the power n, which is rather substantial. Whereas um, it's, it is going to be much smaller here. That's not so much vis visible here yet, but in the next result by Bolobash, Kohayakawa and Buchak, which is 10 years later, they really managed to sort of show uh, something about uh, uh, how small this object here becomes. But these are pretty detailed estimates where they're showing that if epsilon is sufficiently negative, the largest connected component is basically 2 over epsilon squared times the log of 2 to the power n. Whereas if epsilon is sufficiently positive, something like 1 over n, then actually it's roughly epsilon times 2 to the power n. So bear in mind, these bounds are polynomial in n, whereas these, this number here is exponential. So you basically go from something that's polynomial here to something that is exponential here. That's a pretty big jump. So you could say, well, we aren't really close to the critical value yet. But then it immediately raises the question again, what is critical? All right, so let me write down what these, uh, what re these results are. So I tai Komlosh and Samaretti, 82. They basically say that PC is 1 over n times 1 plus small o of 1. Bolo Bolobash, Kohayakawa and Buchak in 92, they say that PC is 1 over n times 1 plus capital O of, so I have to check, something well, something polynomial. I think the worst thing is log n squared over the square root of n. But on the other side, it's, it's uh, slightly different. So it's small, but it's not that small. And what you see is that you really jump enormously by going from one side to the other side. So I would say that these results are still in the barely sub and barely supercritical regime, but of course the question is how to define what is critical. And in their paper they actually raised the question whether the critical value is equal to 1 over n minus 1. Now that may look a bit weird, but it's not so strange. The reason why you have this is that on any graph, any transitive graph, let's say an infinite transitive graph, you can show that PC is always greater than or equal to 1 over the degree minus 1. There's a branching process comparison that you can do. Right? You have in total the degree number of edges that you might use, but in order to get to a vertex you have to eat up 1, so there's only the degree minus 1 left, and you, know, you better be able to continue, otherwise you're going to be dead. Right? So this you should really think of as 1 over the degree minus 1. So that that raises a question. The question is, is this true? Now, we were told of this story when I was doing a, a visit at uh, Microsoft Research by Joel Spencer. And uh, he said, you know, with the results on, on high dimensional percolation that have been established uh, at, the, at that point in time, can you say something a bit more precise? And in fact, he came to us with the question, you know, if you take p to be 1 over n plus something over n squared, say. Can you identify what that something should be? Now we started thinking about this as a, as a mathematical physics problem, and we were trying to figure out what should be critical behavior. So we basically didn't really answer the question of Joel at that point in time, but we rather started thinking about what critical should mean in this setting. So let's look again here. What is special here? Well here, the largest connected component is n to the power 2 thirds. But that's a random variable. It's very difficult to say PC should satisfy that the largest connected component is n to the power 2 thirds, because it's random. So rather, we take this criterion, expected cluster size is the number of vertices raised to the power of a third. Expected cluster size is a, is a continuous function of P, so you could take that as a definition. Then of course you still have to prove that it's a proper definition of the critical value. But this is what was done in uh, a series of papers with Borks, Chase, myself, uh, Gordon Slate, and uh, Joel Spencer. Sometimes these papers are referred to as the Bitches papers, for obvious reasons, um, meaning the acronym. Um, and what we do was 
that we just take the expected cluster size as a function of p, it's a continuous function, it will grow from 0 for p is equal to 0 to the volume of the graph 2 to the power n for p is 1, and we just take the point where this expected cluster size is equal to 2 to the power n over 3. Of course this seems like uh, a definition that I just pull out of my hat and that may not make any sense to you. Right? So what I'll argue in the remainder of the talk is that this is actually a relevant definition and it's probably the right definition. All right, so that means that the challenge is that we have to prove that the, the critical value that is defined in this way really is a critical value. And one way of doing that is by investigating the, the structure of connected components above and below this critical value. All right. So this is the first result. And this you should really think of in terms of what it was for the, uh, for the Irish Renewan graph, which really serves as the inspiration for our results. So let me go through it uh, slowly. I take P to be the PC that, that was defined here, this PC, and I multiply it by 1 plus epsilon. And either epsilon can be positive or negative, and I'm trying to figure out which epsilons will give me something critical. Now in the first result, you should think of this as being the subcritical case. I'm taking my epsilon to be negative, and much smaller than the inverse of the cube root of the graph. So that actually says that I'm in this regime, but then with a lambda that slowly tends to infinity. And here, I should really think of this as corresponding to the volume of the graph, not the degree. Whereas this, I should think of as the degree of the graph. Okay? And what we see then is behavior that is very similar to what, uh, what we see on the, uh, uh, on the Erdős Renyi random graph. In particular, the maximum cluster size is of the order 2 over epsilon squared times the log of epsilon cubes times 2 to the power n. And this logarithmic term really is substantial because that's precisely what this is saying. And there should be an absolute value there, by the way, which I didn't write down. Okay? So, so the left hand side, is, it, is there a log of something missing? The left, no, there isn't. So in, in these results, that actually is not good. The lower bound is not good. But this was later improved by uh, Asaf Nachmias and, uh, and Tim Hulshoff. Uh, and they can prove that, that the same thing is true, but then with a constant times this, not with a constant 2. Well, it's still an improvement, but it's, it's not there yet. But that you should really think of that as being the order of magnitude. So this corresponds to the cluster sizes on the Erdős Renyi random graph in the subcritical regime, the barely subcritical regime. Now on the other hand, I can also look at what happens within this critical window, where, bear in mind, we should take this epsilon to be of the order 1 over the volume of the graph to the power of 1 third. So in this case, that's 2 to the power minus n over 3. And then what we see is that the maximum component is of size 2 to the power 2n over 3 both in terms of a lower bound and in terms of an upper bound. And it's precisely the same as it was on the uh, erdos renyi random graph, where you should think of this 2 to the power of minus n over 3 as being the volume of the graph, which is little n for the, uh, uh, for the erdos renyi random graph. Okay, yes? Mm, you don't write anything about chi of p in this window. Why? Is it, uh, is it clear that... This is the window. It remains of the same order. No, you, you don't write anything about the mean, value, uh, the mean size of the cluster. Oh, it's, 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 it's 2 to the power 2 and over 3, yeah, right. Yeah, the, lower, the, the expectation of uh, C max can also be bounded from above and below by constant times 2 to the power 2 and over 3. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is the omega? In the oh, so this basically says that I do this for a regime of little lambda, this is actually a, a capital lambda, where, where this lambda in absolute value is bounded by some constant. That's what it means. The omega appearing in the... Uh oh, this is a large constant. Right? So you should think, in, you should think that C max multiplied by 2 to the power 2 and over 3 converges in distribution to a proper random variable that has no atoms at 0 and infinity. Now we can't quite prove that. But this sort of looks like it, right? It means that if I multiply this by 2 to the power 2n over 3, then it's a tight sequence of random variables because the probability that it will be larger than some large value uh, omega will be small. 
and also one over it will be tight because the probability that one over it is larger than omega is also pretty small. Yeah? So it's a tightness statement. Good question. Any other questions? All right. So I started talking about the, uh, the hypercube, but as it turns out, there's nothing special about the hypercube. We can also think about other high dimensional tori. I mean, in the, on the hypercube, you take 0, 1 and you raise it to the power n. But what would happen if you would take 0, 1, 2 to the power n? Or if you would take a large cube and raise it to a fixed power, then you get high dimensional percolation on a torus. Huh? We are in high dimensions, because for the hypercube we take the dimension to infinity, so... Right? Okay, now we actually uh, addressed that question as well. Our results are, are less sharp there, but we basically do the same thing. So we have a torus here, the width is denoted by little r, and the dimension is denoted by little d. And then we do precisely the same thing as what we do on the hypercube, namely, we say that the expected cluster size is equal to the volume to the power of third. Ignore lambda, just take it one. Actually, lambda plays an important role in the proof, which is why it occurs here. But for all practical purposes, you can forget about it. And then we need some peculiar condition, which sort of seems to come falling out of the sky. Um, and if we have that, that assumption, then actually the results that I was referring to here with appropriate modifications, because the volume of the graph is changing, carry through. Now, this condition looks very weird. It's called a triangle condition. But it's not that weird, because we actually know that if you do percolation on Zd, the infinite Zd, then this triangle condition plays a very important role there. It actually quantifies when the percolation phase transition is mean field, meaning when the percolation phase transition on Zd is very similar to the percolation phase transition on a tree, which does not have any geometry, or when it's the same as the phase transition of a branching process. And if you want to include geometry, when it's the same as the critical behavior of a branching random walk. Yeah? So this condition has appeared before, but then on infinite graphs, it was invented by Eisenman and Newman, and it has become one of the key properties that signals high dimensionality of percolation on a graph. And this is an adaptation to finite graphs. Because on a finite graph, of course, this, this triangle will always be finite, but we want it to be uniformly finite. That's what it says. Now, we actually do know this condition, after a lot of work, for percolation on the nearest neighbor torus for the dimension large but fixed. Think of d being 25 and r tending to infinity. Then you would believe that percolation on this large torus should be very close to critical percolation on Zd. And that's what we'll see later on. So that's precisely the setting. Now, you have to be careful here. The reason is that I'm actually quantifying that this PC satisfies this funny equation, right? Now, if I think about percolation on a high dimensional torus, which is extremely big, I would believe that the critical value ought to be the same, roughly the same, very close to the critical value in the infinite lattice. That's certainly not obvious from these statements. It is true, but it requires uh, uh, quite some proofs. All right. Now, this is a result that only works on the hypercube. This is a result with uh, Asaf Nachmias, photo taken at uh, Oberwolfach. Um, and it really shows that the, the, uh, the critical window is what we believe it to be from the earlier two uh, theorems. Because in these earlier two theorems, what we were showing is that if you're on the left of the critical window, then actually clusters are very small. If you're within the critical window, then clusters are of size volume to the power two thirds. What we are missing is the statement that above the critical window, the cluster is concentrated and it's large. And that's what this says. It says that above the uh, scaling window, the largest connected component is roughly a constant times epsilon times two to the power n. It's identical as what it was. Uh, for the Erdős-Vendi random graph. And the second largest component is smaller. 
So the giant component is unique, as you would hope it would be. And we can also compute the expected cluster size. Okay? So this can be interpreted by saying that the percolation phase transition on the hypercube and on the complete graph are very alike. Now there's another interpretation that you could give here that is actually quite relevant and it plays an important role in the study of the erdos wenyi random graph and that is a connection to branching processes. You can really think of this two epsilon here as being the probability of a Poisson branching process to survive. And that probability is the same as somehow taking a vertex uniformly at random in your complete graph and asking its cluster to be large, whatever large means. That's also, that probability is also going to be 2 epsilon. Okay? And the remarkable statement that you see here is that almost all the vertices that have a large cluster are actually in the same connected component. They're all connected to one another. That's the statement. That's a bit of a surprise. Is that statement clear? Okay. Now we're still left with this question, which we haven't, uh, which I didn't even write down. So there was a question whether PC is actually equal to 1 over n minus 1. And there was a good reason for this. So if we think of somehow the tree approximation to the hypercube, we would just build a tree in which every vertex has a degree precisely n, and the critical value on that tree would be precisely 1 over n minus 1. Okay? But it turns out that this is not the critical value. And it's not even close. Why not? Well, as it turns out, there is something like an asymptotic expansion for the critical value in terms of inverse powers of 1 over n. You should think of n as being extremely large. Right? So bear in mind that if I would want to think about 1 over n minus 1, well, that's the same thing as 1 over n plus 1 over n squared plus 1 over n cubed plus 1 over n to the power 4, etc. Adding that, sum, that geometric series indefinitely will give me 1 over n minus 1. So this also has this same feature. But as it turns out, this asymptotic expansion is correct. But it turns out that the coefficients are slightly different. The first two are the same, also both 1, but the third is 7 halves rather than 1. So that means that the critical value on the hypercube is a little bit bigger than what you would believe it to be on a tree with the same degree. That's what it says. And I, that's actually not so surprising, because if you think about a hypercube, um, it, it really isn't the tree. Because there's lots of cycles of size 4, lots of little squares, and if you were to approximate it by a tree, if you would go two sides of a square, you would think of these points as being different, but they really are the same. So on the tree, you're overcounting this point by a factor 2. Now, of course, it's not that likely that you have these, but you are going to have many of those. So somehow, you're, if, you, if you equate this to be the critical value, you're underestimating what it really is. And this says that it, this is indeed the case. Now, we cannot compute all these other exponents. There are lots of them here. We know that they're rational. We know that they exist. But we don't know what they are. We can compute the first three. That was for us relevant, because we see that the third is different from the one of 1 over n minus 1. I'm guessing that the fourth one is 16, but I don't have a proof for this. And the proof would probably be very long. All right. So. Let me spend a few words on the proof, not that, that many. The proof is fairly complicated. The, uh, the, the paper with Asaf uh, in the Journal of the European Mathematical Society is 90 pages. And that was sort of the sixth or the seventh in a, in a row. The other ones are somewhat shorter, but uh, they're also quite long. Um, it, it's a difficult story. It's difficult to make these things precise. Um, so how do we do these subcritical proofs? Well, we do this immediately for several graphs at the same time. Not just for the hypercube, but also for these high dimensional tori, and, and in fact the proof also works for the complete graph. So we take a relatively abstract approach, and the abstract approach is very similar to the abstract approach that is used in high dimensions if you want to investigate critical percolation, let's say in Z25, 
there we know that the critical behavior is also very much alike the critical behavior of a, of a branching process. And the tool of the trade there is, some, is, a, is a combinatorial identity. It's an expansion technique, which is called the lace expansion. Now the lace expansion is a difficult technique, but it can be understood. And at the end of the slides, I will refer to uh, a survey on the topic uh, where we basically do the lace expansion in all detail at an expository level and also describe all the, uh, the progress that has been made on high dimensional percolation, including hypercube percolation, but also some other topics. That's what I would like to say about this proof. I think that's enough. Now, I would like to spend a, f uh, a few minutes on the supercritical setting, which, bear in mind, we were only doing for the hypercube. In fact, the results apply a bit more general, and I heard somebody speak here about expanders. One example for which it applies is expanders with a sufficiently large girth. So percolation on an expander with a sufficiently large girth also has this similar uh, qualitative uh, uh, phase transition where you see the giant component emerge uh, above the scaling window, and the scaling window has the same shape as on the Erdős Rényi Ernograph. Now, if you want to formulate the precise settings under which, uh, under which the results apply, it's three quantities. First of all, we need that the degree tends to infinity. So we're talking about high degrees, like the D regular graph with D tending to infinity. Um, then there is a condition that relates two objects, random walk and percolation, which are a little bit weird. So m is the degree, I take m minus 1 times pc, bear in mind that's roughly this first order approximation to the critical value. Right? If it were a tree then this would be precisely the critical value, but we know that generally pc is a bit larger than that. We raise that to the power of this t mix, and that should still be roughly 1. Why this comes out this way is not entirely obvious, but let me describe why it is true for the hypercube. So for the hypercube, we know that PC is 1 over n plus 1 over n squared plus 7 halves over n cubed, plus higher order terms. Right? So if I multiply by n minus 1, I have to multiply this by n minus 1, and then I get 1 plus capital O of 1 over n squared. Do the arithmetic. It's a third order term that actually deviates from this. This is precisely 1 over n minus 1, so if it would be this, then I would get 1. But it isn't this, because this one is a bit larger. So that means that I basically have to blow this up by a factor n, and that's going to be my error term. Okay? Now it turns out that this mixing time, the mixing time of random walks is actually pretty well known, the mixing time of random walk on a hypercube, and that's of the order n log n. But bear in mind, we're not looking here at the mixing time of a normal random walk. In fact, we're looking at the mixing time of something which is called the non-backtracking random walk. And that's just the same as a regular random walk, it's just that you have to keep track of where you were before and just not step back. So you don't track back your last step. It turns out that also that mixing time is the same. That's actually a one-half here. Now if I raise this, to the power t mix, that's the same thing as raising this to the power t mix, and then we get 1 plus, well, some constant over n squared to the power n log n, and that's indeed 1 plus small o of 1. Bear in mind, here it's crucial that I go all the way up to size 1 over n squared, not 1 over n. That would not have been enough. If it would have been 1 plus a constant over n raised to the power n log n, I would be out of business. Okay? So indeed, this result applies. Good. Yes? This asymptotic expansion is not con does not converge? Do you know that it does not converge? It's believed, and this is an open problem, so there are lots of open problems in this big survey. It's believed to be Borel summable, but not summable. So uh, similar identities hold for Zd. And there the coefficients have been non-rigorously established. By the way, the, the coefficients there are the same rigorously 
uh, you should replace n by the degree of that graph, which is 2d. But then the next term is 16, the next term is 105. It sort of starts growing rather uncomfortably. So it probably doesn't converge. But this is not known. Um, it is believed that they are Borel summable, and that would mean that if you divide through by n another n factorial or something like that, that it would be summable. Um, so really, the idea of thinking of this as being an infinite sum and ignoring the error, not a good idea. That will probably start becoming negative or larger than one or whatever if, uh, if n is too large. Good question. But are there any speculation on the function of which this is an asymptotic expansion? Sorry, I didn't get you that. You are saying that actually this is still an asymptotic expansion. It's an asymptotic expansion, but you have to be careful with yeah, the names. Yeah, are there any yeah. speculation about the nature of this function, poles? Yeah, Borel summable. No, I mean just concrete nature, like where it has poles, I mean, in the complex plane or something. Oh. No idea. You're probably the right person to answer these questions and to ask them. I'm certainly not. <laughs> so I, I wanted to, s to give a, a bit of uh, the ingredients to the proof. It's a few slides somehow trying to highlight what the key ingredients are. Um, there's four key steps basically in the proof. And in the very first step we're trying to analyze how many vertices we have in large clusters, where large is not let's say 2 epsilon times 2 to the power n, but it's pretty substantial. Yeah? So that's what this random variable measures. It measures the number of v for which the connected component in which v is, the number of vertices that that contains. So that's all the number of vertices to which little v is connected after doing percolation. That's what this object is. It's greater than or equal to some k where k will be appropriately chosen and it will actually be sufficiently large. And this means sufficiently large. Then actually we know that that number, for that choice of k0, really has the same order of magnitude as what we believe to be the giant component. Recall, the giant component has size 2 epsilon 2 to the power n, and now we have something that can certainly not be more than the giant component, that basically has the same order of magnitude. So what we would still like to prove is that all of these vertices, or most of these vertices, are in the same connected component. That was proof one. Now the second step is sort of this remarkable connection to the mixing time of non-backtracking walk. And that turned out to be a very handy technique that allows you to simplify all sorts of nasty sums that we get in our proofs and just replace them by some nasty functions that depend on the spatial coordinate and just replace them by their, by their average. So bear in mind, if I, if I think about anything on the, on the complete graph, you have complete symmetry. So if I look at the probability that 2 is in the cluster of 1, that's the same as the probability that 3 is in the cluster of 1, 4 is in the cluster of 1, 5 is in the cluster, so there's complete symmetry. Now on the hypercube that's not true, because if I take one vertex, the other pole is much further away from it than its immediate neighbors. So its immediate neighbors are much more likely to be in the same connected component as this vertex than the other pole. Now somehow on a qualitative level, what this shows is that if you take a percolation path that is sufficiently long, then the endpoint of that path is somehow completely mixed. It could basically be anywhere. So rather than fixing this point, I could also replace it by the sum over this point and divide through by the total number of vertices. That's very convenient. If my spatial functions no longer depend on the spatial variable, they all become constant, but certainly life becomes much easier. So that's the role that non-backtracking random walk plays. So it says something like this. If I take an R that is sufficiently large, then this probability that, that zero, say, is connected to x in a path that is sufficiently large can be uniformly bounded in little x if, x, if uh, little r is sufficiently large. So if I, for example, then think about this, then I can just replace the little x by summing out over all possible x and dividing through by v. If all of these are the same, then of course summing and dividing by the number of summons is the same as any, any of its values. Right? But this clearly depends on x, whereas this is completely independent of x. So that's a nice trick. So that's how 
non-backtracking random walk enters the picture. And somehow this bound, this here, you can think of the, the, the number of occupied percolation paths of length t mix. So this is the expected number of occupied percolation paths of length t mix, and that's roughly one. So on average, if I take a vertex, there will be roughly one vertex at distance this t mix. And t mix is not that large. Okay? Good. Now, the, the proof will go by a sprinkling argument where we say we have some p, p is, p is supercritical, we think of p as consisting of two little parts, a slightly smaller value, and then we sprinkle extra edges on it. So what we would like to do is to investigate what the chance is that somehow clusters are merging together. So what I would like to know is an estimate on the number of vertices that will start creating a cluster when I raise p a little bit. Now for that, it's crucial to know how many boundary edges there are between the, the clusters of these two vertices. Because if they're, if, they're not, if they're touching one another and I increase p, then I will make some of these edges, if they're sufficiently many, I will make some of these edges occupied, and then all of a sudden my two vertices are connected to one another. Hey, now we have a much larger cluster. Right? So that's the idea. But then of course I need to know first that sufficiently many vertices have sufficiently many closed edges between their clusters, and their cluster should be large. So that's what this statement says. So here we say uh, we have two, x, two, two vertices x and y, that could be arbitra uh, uh, arbitrary vertices. Now I look at the number of edges between the boundaries of their clusters. So this says that the path, percolation path between x and u has, has at most l edges, the percolation path between y and u prime has at most l edges, and then I'm counting these uv's. So if this uv was already occupied, then actually the two vertices are in the same connected component. If, they're clo if it's closed and I sprinkle a little bit, make it occupied, then all of a sudden after that change x and y will be in the same connected component. Okay, so this is, the, this is counting the number of edges and I want that number of edges to be sufficiently large. That's what this says. Don't, don't care about the precise uh, formulation of the constant. Uh, it just says that the number of closed edges between these two vertices are large and then we call such a pair good. And what I would like to know is that there are sufficiently many good pairs. Because the good pairs after sprinkling will start coagulating very quickly and then they will form a giant component. So if I know that there are sufficiently many of them, I'm in shape for doing a sprinkling argument. And this says that, so I, bear in mind, I'm already saying that my clusters are large. So I cannot have more than 2 epsilon times 2 to the power n, v is the volume, it's 2 to the power n, squared of these pairs. Because I, I, I have only that many vertices that are in large clusters. But what this statement says is that almost all of those pairs are actually good. So almost all the pairs of vertices that have a large cluster actually also have many edges, closed edges between them. That's a pretty nice statement. So then this sets us up for sprinkling. And sprinkling basically says that we take two p's, a p that is slightly smaller than what we have, and then we increase it a little bit, and we think about percolation as being obtained by first taking the p1 percolation, and then sprinkling extra edges on the closed edges, which are these ones, with the extra p2. And if I do this in the appropriate way, such that this, equal, that this equality holds, then if I look at the union of these two percolations, then I'll actually get my original percolation model. That's how it's set up. So we take a p that is slightly smaller, we prove that there's lots of large clusters with lots of nice properties, etc., etc., and then we sprinkle some extra edges on it to make the p the right value, and then we see that all of these large clusters merge. I will not go through the details, um, but this is, this is where it goes. And that actually then completes uh, the proof. Um, this argument is very alike what Aitai, Komlosh and Sam Reddy did, but they use an isoparametric inequality instead. So rather than looking at closed edges, they looked at large paths. And that is wasteful and therefore you lose a lot. So therefore you cannot get to the critical value. 
this argument is a bit more robust. All right, well, I've been saying so far that many of these techniques are true, are, are usable rather generally in high dim engines. Now, that's what this result says. And that's a result with Markus Heidenreich, who's now in M Munich, who was my PhD student uh, graduating in 2011, I think. Um, it says that if I look at the critical value for percolation on the full lattice, that is what I would call the critical value for percolation, and if I compare that to the critical value of on the hypercube, as defined by the expected cluster size being the volume to the power of one third, then their distance is precisely of the order one over the volume to the power of one third. So this says that the critical value of percolation on the infinite lattice is inside my scaling window. That was defined in a way that completely did not make use of Zd as a whole. So this immediately implies that all of the results that have been proving so far also apply to critical percolation on a high torus, where critical really means the critical value of Zd. All right. That's one result that I wanted to say about high dimensional percolation. The second is the following, which is one of the most novel uh, parts on high dimensional percolation. This is joined with another former PhD student, uh, Robert Fitzner, and um, for those of you who know something about percolation, there was always this discussion about what is high dimensional. So think about nearest neighbor percolation. Well, there was an unpublished document by Hara and Slate that was saying that 19 was enough. But there's nothing special about 19 except for the fact that it's the smallest integer that is smaller than 20. Right? So they started doing some analysis and they, at first it was working for d is equal to 48. They said, ah, that's not quite good enough. And then they got it down to something like 25. And at a certain moment it was clear that they weren't able to go to the appropriate dimension, which is 7, because of this triangle condition. They weren't able to go all the way down. And then they said, well, you know, 19 actually sounds a lot less than 20. So let's go to 19. They worked very hard, got it to 19, and then they stopped. Th that proof was never published. There are handwritten notes, it's about a stack this big, which I've gotten from Takashi Hara, that was extremely useful. And we decided to take this up again because we were thinking that somehow an analysis that would be slightly improved on the basis of non-backtracking random walk um, might give us, get us a bit closer to the upper critical dimension. And indeed it does. We're not able to go all the way down to dimension seven, and I don't think we will be able to go down there ever with our methodology. But we can go to dimension 11, so d greater than 10. And actually, that methodology does not only give us uh, control over the critical exponents, but it also gives us control over the critical value. So our estimates, our upper bound on PC, are provably 1.3% off the real value, which I think is pretty OK. We, don't, we have no idea what the critical value is in, in 11 dimensions. But we can give a bound. And the bound is roughly 1 over 2d minus 1, except for 1.3%. Okay? I'm not going to explain how this is done. I'm running out of time. Uh, here are a few open problems. There are many more. And if you want to see a really huge list, look at this book, which is uh, almost done. It's on the basis of a summer school that I've taught at uh, CRM in, in Montreal, the PIM CRM summer school, 24 hours of lectures on high dimensional percolation. That gave rise to this, uh, this book of about 270 pages. You can download the PDF from my webpage. And there's lots of problems there on boundary conditions, on, uh, you know, name it, oriented percolation, all sorts of other models. Uh, so uh, they might not be as big as the questions that uh, Dima was uh, posing this morning, but there are certainly quite a few that are quite nice and uh, that might get you going. Now here are a few um, open problems that I personally find quite interesting. So study the, the limit in probability of the largest uh, cluster in subcritical phase of a hypercube percolation. So bear in mind, this is partially resolved by Nachmias and, and Hulshoff. They show that uh, this largest subcritical cluster is of the order one over epsilon squared times a log, uh, 
but they don't get the right constant. So the upper bound is 2, we believe the 2 to be sharp, but we don't have a proof for that. It's a nice problem. Um, very much related to this, and that's actually what, what inspired also this question, what is the size of the second largest component in the supercritical regime? In the erdos renyi graph, and it's related to the phase transition of branching processes, there's a beautiful theorem which is called duality. If I have a supercritical branching process, I condition it to die out, then actually that's a subcritical branching process with an offspring distribution that you can determine exactly. On the erdos renyi graph, that says something like the following. Suppose I'm in the supercritical regime in the erdos renyi graph. Now I remove the giant component, then I have a much smaller graph. That much smaller graph is a subcritical erdos renyi graph of a smaller size and a P that you can compute explicitly, or at least asymptotically, and you can show that it really is subcritical. So that explains why the second largest component in the erdos renyi graph above the critical value is logarithmic in size, because it's the same as a subcritical largest component, which is logarithmic, right? So we don't know that here. We only have very weak results on the second largest component. We prove that it's smaller than the largest, but it should actually be, there should be a large gap. It should even be true that the second largest component decreases with epsilon. We have no idea how to do that. Very nice problem. Now, of course, we have a concentrated giant component that immediately raises the question whether there is also a central limit theorem for it. There probably is. Proving it may be harder. Um, within the critical window, we don't know that the, the, the critical clusters are actually truly random, that they converge in distribution to proper random variables. Prove that, and prove that the scaling limit then also is the same as the scaling limit of the erdos renyi graph as identified beautifully by uh, David Aldous in the 1997 paper. Maybe hard. Extend that to percolation on the nearest neighbor torus with a d greater than or equal to 11. We haven't done that. It may be possible, but we don't know whether we can do it, whether our, kind of, uh, our numerical control is sufficient for that. Here are some of the papers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Remco, for this very exciting uh, talk. So, uh, are there any questions? Is it possible to do numerical simulations in the critical phase on the hypercube, or is the space just too big? That's an excellent question. Bear in mind that the width of the critical window is 2 to the power minus n over 3. Take n 100. Mm. It's nothing. Mm. How are you ever going to see the difference? Uh, I mean, it's basically one point. And we don't know what that point is. Right? We don't know what the critical, critical value is. So I have no idea how to do this. It would be very interesting. I mean, we know that the largest connected but component is concentrated above the critical point, but... But you can add, uh, for example, edges one by one. Yeah, and, and when are then, you going to uh, stop? Well, you're going you're gonna to stop whenever the, the largest uh, component is of the size you want. It's volume right? to the power two-thirds. Yeah, yes. you could do that. But that's not going to be enough to give you, for example, a proxy of the scaling limit of the largest connected component, because all of a sudden now these are deterministic, right? Mm. So you would rather do it the other way around. Fix a P inside your scaling window, and then see what the largest connected component looks like. I don't know how to do that. So it's a good question. If anybody has an idea, I would certainly be very much interested in this. So any other questions? How do you uh, compute the coefficients in the asymptotic assumption, uh, asymptotic expansion of the uh, yeah. Uh, critical? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, the first answer is the lace expansion. The lace expansion gives you an implicit equation for PC uh, that you can iteratively use, sort of inductively, by looking at the coefficients and doing asymptotics on those, and they will crunch out all of these coefficients. You could do this arbitrarily far. So in terms of the upper bound, so bear in mind that for this analysis, we only needed the upper bound. We also have a completely independent proof of this upper bound with the seven halves that does not rely on the lace expansion. So that's technically less uh, demanding. And that's just computing 
computing how many points you are going to be connected with. And somehow, if this expected size is, is very large, then you know that the expected cluster size is quite large, and if the expected cluster size is quite large, then you're supercritical, right? Because that was the definition of the critical point. So that's a bit sort of more calculus alike. Also, again, using these non-backtracking random walk ideas. But that's only an upper bound. The upper bound typically is the hardest, but still. We didn't think about proving the lower bound in the same way or proving higher order terms in this way. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Oh. So maybe a soft question for the yeah. end. Um, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the, the, your personal story when uh, you, you were a postdoc at Microsoft and uh, uh, you yes. were a young postdoc and you discovered yeah. with all the others these uh, so nice I, results? I was a postdoc at Microsoft, but that was not when I was started this. Microsoft Research has a very interesting visiting program over the summer. So after I was a postdoc in 1998, I came back uh, several times and all of this work was done in a, in a summer visit in 2004. And uh, that was actually quite exciting because uh, for my birthday I had just gotten the book N is a Number or something like that uh, about the life of Erdos. So I was reading in the evenings in this book about Erdos. And then I would go to Microsoft and there I would see Bela Bolobos, Joel Spencer. You know, all the people who were listed in that book would be there. <laughs> that was very exciting. Yeah. So we had a lot of fun uh, uh, trying to discuss. It, it, this, the, 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 the people who are doing uh, Erdos Rinji Random Graph like problems, they are much more combinatorial than we were at that time, so we were more from a mathematical physics perspective, so we really had to learn a little bit how to speak each other's language. And uh, a, a large part of the time that we spent there was actually spent on precisely that, uh, trying to understand what they were saying and uh, they trying to understand what we were saying. So, uh, for example, I've sometimes heard uh, Joel Spencer say that this is the least expansion this is certainly an expansion, but this is not the least expansion. So <laughs> there are some language barriers that you need to come across when you, when you do this kind of, uh, even interdisciplinary projects within math. If you're talking with people from a different community, then they, they use the same words, but all of a sudden it means something completely different. And people with experience in biology probably recognize that. <laughs> Okay, so uh, any other question? So if not, let's thank Remco again, and of course, all of the other speakers today.